Number 1. The Giant Hot Coffee Caution Labels Have you ever wondered why coffee cups come with specific lid design and giant hot warnings? In 1992, 79-year-old Stella Liebeck ordered coffee through the McDonald's drive-thru, and her grandson drove to a parking spot where she put the cup between her knees to add cream and sugar. McDonald's had this weird corporate policy to serve coffee at 180 to 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Your home coffee maker brews at around 150 to 160 degrees. The difference between those temperatures is the difference between hot and third degree burns in three seconds. While the coffee cup was between her knees, the lid popped off and the coffee spilled into her lap. The beverage was so hot that it fused her skin together with the burns covering 16% of her body, mostly on her inner thighs and groin area. You would think this was just an isolated incident and that Stella was in the wrong, until you realize McDonald's had received over 700 previous complaints about their coffee being too hot and causing burns, but they'd silence people and settle claims quietly, paying out small amounts and continue serving it hot anyway, explicitly knowing their coffee was dangerous. To cover her medical bills, Stella wanted McDonald's to pay her $20,000, but the company offered $800. That's like offering someone a gift card after setting their house on fire. She then filed a civil lawsuit and the jury awarded her $2.7 million in punitive damages, but eventually settled for an undisclosed amount. Although it was too late, McDonald's eventually learned from their mistakes and lowered their coffee temperature by 10 degrees, and every coffee cup now came with warnings so large you could read them from across the room. Number 2. The Rotten Egg Smell in Natural Gas Natural gas smells like rotten eggs, because a school board decided to steal gas, and that decision vaporized nearly 300 children in a single explosion. In 1937, the New London Consolidated School in East Texas was about to be dismissed for the day, when an unnamed shop teacher on the workbench flipped on an electric sander, and the spark from the motor ignited the air. See, the school board had canceled their contract with the local gas company to save $300 per month gas service fee, and decided to illegally tap into a residue gas line from a nearby oil operation. Natural gas is mostly methane and completely odorless, so the gas leaked and filled the school with no indication that the building was sitting on top of a bomb. The explosion was so powerful it lifted the entire school off its foundation, with around 500 students and 40 teachers inside when it exploded. After the incident, the Texas state legislature passed a law requiring an odorant to be added to natural gas, and now natural gas smells like rotten eggs added to it as a safety measure. Number three. The brake override systems. Every modern car now has software that makes the brake pedal override the gas pedal. If you're stomping on both, the brake wins. This feature exists because a California Highway Patrol officer couldn't stop his family's car and drove straight into an intersection at 120 miles per hour. In 2009, Mark Saylor, a 45-year-old California Highway Patrol officer, was driving with his family in a 2009 Lexus ES350. The Lexus was a loner from a dealership while his car was being serviced. Everything was fine until the accelerator pedal got stuck to the floor. Here's where it gets interesting. The dealership had installed the wrong floor mat, a Lexus RX 400 floor mat, which is thicker and longer than the one designed for the ES350. This mat could slide forward and trap the accelerator pedal against the floor. Toyota knew about this problem and they'd issued recalls and even sent out warnings, but this dealership either didn't know or didn't care and they handed Sailor a car with a death trap on the floor. When the accelerator stuck, Sailor tried shifting to neutral, but the electronic shifter in the car required a specific sequence of movements that are hard to execute when you're accelerating uncontrollably. The car hit 120 miles per hour, and as they approached a T-intersection, it launched off the end of the road, crashed through a fence flipping multiple times. This crash had triggered Toyota to recall over 8 million vehicles, and paid a $1.2 billion settlement to avoid criminal prosecution. The solution was brake override systems, now a standard in virtually every car. When the brake and accelerator are pressed simultaneously, the car assumes you want to stop and cuts power to the engine. Number 4. The Panic Bars on Exit Doors Have you ever wondered how push bar handles became a thing on every emergency door? Well, it began when 600 people packed into a theater, couldn't figure out how to open the doors, and burned alive. In 1903, the Iroquois Theater in Chicago was showing a matinee performance of Mr. Bluebeard, a musical comedy. The theater was brand new, supposedly fireproof, marketed as the safest theater in America at the time. During the second act, a stage light sparked and ignited a curtain. Someone backstage tried to lower the fireproof asbestos curtain to contain the flames, and the curtain got stuck halfway down, spreading the fire across the stage. 
Here's where it gets weird. Some exits were locked entirely because theater owner wanted to prevent people from sneaking in without paying, and the theater's exit doors opened inward designed with European-style basco locks. You had to know the trick to open them. Upon investigation, it was revealed that the building inspector had been pressured to issue an occupancy permit before the theater was actually safe, and the city officials had accepted bribes to overlook violations. After the fire, Carl Prinzler, a hardware salesman, developed what we now call the panic bar. When you push it, the door opens outward, and you don't need to turn anything or understand any mechanism for the door to open. It also led to strict fire safety codes, and exit doors must be clearly marked with illuminated signs and open outward in the direction of escape. Number five, the double hull tankers. Every oil tanker built after 1990 has two hulls, one inside the other, like a ship wearing armor. This exists because a drunk, exhausted captain, an underqualified crew, and a series of catastrophically stupid decisions turned 25 miles of Alaskan coastline into an oil-soaked graveyard. In 1989, the Exxon Valdez, a single hull supertanker carrying 53 million gallons of crude oil, was navigating through Prince William Sound, Alaska. The captain was supposed to be on the bridge, but he'd left the ship in the hands of a third mate who wasn't certified. He was below deck, possibly sleeping off the vodka he'd been drinking earlier in port. And here's where things messed up. The ship was supposed to stay in the shipping lanes, but there were icebergs in the way, so they got permission to move into a different lane to go around the ice, then turn back. The third mate tried to turn the ship, but didn't turn fast enough, and it hit Bly Reef, a well-known underwater rock formation that's marked on every chart. The hull was torn through, and within hours, the oil slick covered several square miles. To save on cost, Exxon had reduced crew sizes. He had also removed the navigation officer position for cost-saving purposes. The disaster led to the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, where all new oil tankers now require double hulls and mandatory tugboat escorts when moving in sensitive areas. Shipping companies also have to prove financial ability to pay for cleanup before they are allowed to operate. The negligence cost Exxon over $2 billion in cleanup fees, and they paid another $1 billion in criminal and civil settlements. Number 6. The Dead Man Switch. Modern trains have automatic speed control systems and dead man switches that stop the train if the operator becomes incapacitated. These exist because the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company decided that a 23-year-old dispatcher with barely any training during a labor dispute could operate a five-car train through a sharp curve, and he killed 93 people in under five seconds. In 1918, Edward Luciano was a dispatcher, meaning he normally stood on platforms and told trains when to go. He had received maybe a few days of informal training on operation. The Brooklyn Rapid Transit was in a labor dispute with its motorman's union, so they decided to run trains anyway using whoever was available. So Luciano got handed a five-cars wooden train and told to drive. Everything was fine until he approached the curve at Malbone Street, nearly a 90-degree turn which had a speed limit of six miles per hour. Here's where it gets insane. Luciano was running behind schedule, unfamiliar with the controls, and running at somewhere between 30 and 40 miles per hour. The first car made it partway through the curve, derailed, then smashed into the concrete wall of the tunnel. The wooden cars behind splintered like crates dropped from a building. People were crushed between cars, decapitated by the tunnel structure, and 93 were killed. This disaster led to the installations of automatic train protection systems, which monitored the train's speed and position. If the train exceeds the safe speed for a section of track, the system automatically applies the brakes, and if the operator becomes incapacitated, a dead man switch stops the train automatically.